Megan Hicks of Iron Bar. I'm with Nick Curry after your win last weekend at the Whiskey Basin 91K. And this is the second video interview in our Catching Up With video interview series. Hey, Nick, how are you? Good. How are you? Good. So I'm in Silverton, Colorado. Where are you right now? I'm in Scottsdale, Arizona in my house. <laughs> awesome. How are the legs feeling after last weekend? Uh, they're starting to come back around like yeah, up until yesterday, it was that I definitely just raced an ultra and I don't like running right now. Uh, and today, like there's no pep there, but at least I could enjoy a slow pace again. Now, when I think of you as an ultra runner, I feel like you are one of those people who intentionally try to slide under the radar and like stay out of the world view and then just come blazing saddles at the end of races and just show up as you. Um, and so maybe because of that, or maybe because um, I failed as a journalist, this is our first time interviewing you on I Run Far. I can't believe that because you've been an ultra runner a long time. <laughs> yes, I have. And I, I suppose that's completely true. I, I, it is definitely true. I try to slide under the radar. I mostly stay off social media. I guess I'm a little more on it these days, but uh, I'd rather just get out there and enjoy my run and like not make a big deal about it. Um, but quote unquote, enjoying your run also means like performing really well. Um, a lot of the time. <laughs> I, I definitely, a lot of the appeal to me is the competitive side. Um, obviously I do a lot of like 24 hour and I even do a lot of road races. So I'm real into like the analytical, like you can compare your performance against everyone from all time so that things are consistent and you know, the, the course doesn't matter. But I also have that side of me that like, if I had to choose enjoyment wise between a track 24 hour and hard rock, like I will be out in the mountains every day. <laughs> hard rock or some sort of mountain run if you can. Yeah. Okay. So let's rewind to the beginning of running uh, for you, because I remember I, you and I basically got into ultra running around the same time, like mid 2000s. You were a teenager. Um, <laughs> You had, a, was it because your family was a group of runners or how did you become an ultra runner so young? Yeah. So Jamil, my older brother, uh, got cut from the soccer team where he didn't make tryouts, I think in high school. So he ended up going out for track and our high school and I was two years behind him in school. And so, uh, of course I did the same thing he did and jumped in when I got into high school into cross country and track and did that all four years. And my okay. senior year of high school, uh, younger brother, Nathan also got into running. So all three of us were, and when Jamil graduated, like none of us were fast enough for uh, Arizona state's team, like in division one, like we just weren't quite there. So he got into like the local road racing scene and hooked up with the kind of underground at the time trail running community. I feel like it was only a couple dozen runners in Phoenix that were really into trail ultras. Wow. And so we started running with them. They had this, the Wednesday morning running club. And it was one of those, like, you can only find out it exists by finding the right person to talk to. Like there was no record of it anywhere. Uh, so we were running with them. And then there was this 12 hour night run. that was a training run for across the years. And Jamil was like, let's do this. And we were thinking like, we're high schoolers. Like it's kind of like a sleepover and it's running, which we do. So that sounds awesome. Like, so we didn't know what to expect. Uh, all three of us went there. We dragged two of our friends from the cross country team. Uh, I'd run a uh, 5k in Flagstaff, like a high school race invitational that morning. Uh, so definitely had no idea what I was doing. We, we went out there. Uh, it's, it was at Nardini Manor, the 500 meter dirt loop that across the years used to be at. We like sprinted the first two hours and then got tired. So like walked and jogged some more and then got energy and sprinted again and then ate some pretzels and Gatorade and then sat around a bit and then midnight hit and we yelled midnight madness and we sprint some more. And like, there's this old, you know, super old timer there who's told me the same story four different times. And there is some other runner who's leading the race wearing nothing but Napoleon dynamite boxers and just like rattling off movie quotes the whole time. Uh, so it was bizarre and we were hooked and we all ran about 50 miles and like, that was the introduction to ultra running. I was 17. Uh, we tried to go to across the years thinking we ran 50 and 12, we can totally run 124 and we get some, you know, cool belt buckles as a result. So of course, like I made the biggest improvement over my 12 hour 
<laughs> performance and I made 20 additional miles. Uh, oh. So we, we learned that hard lesson pretty quick. Uh, but yeah, that, that's kind of how all of us got into it right at the same time. Age 17, you run 53 miles in 24 hours and you love it. <laughs> Something like that. I, I, it was painful, but some part of me was addicted. I, 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 think I, I think I loved the idea. I don't think I enjoyed it that much in terms of, yeah, a lot of pain, like did not know how to train or anything at that point. Um, when I look at sort of the types of races you choose, you mentioned this before that you do a diversity of stuff. Um, track races that go on for a day, mountain races that go on for a day, 20Ks, 12 milers, short stuff, long stuff. Is it like any surface, any time, anywhere you'll run? Or is it just, yeah, what, 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 why do you choose the races you do? Yeah, I, I think like I really do love it all, but for different reasons. I suppose the short stuff is that's where I started. I like it definitely makes me a faster runner, but I also do it because I just like to see like it's a challenge and I like to get like the turnover is thrilling. And so those short races are very enjoyable for a certain reason. The long ones are enjoyable for an opposite reason, but mm -hmm. I've, I've just found that I enjoy all of it for what it is. And so in mixing it up, keeps it pretty fresh, keeps me engaged. Like if you looked at the, the sum of it, like there were six years where I didn't do a 24 hour whatsoever because I got burned out on them and they're brutal and tough. Uh, and then now I've done almost exclusively like faster stuff in the last couple of years and done less of the super tough mountain stuff. So I just, I cycle it. I try to keep it interesting to me. I don't worry too much one way or the other. Now, do you take, you mentioned before that you really like the analysis part of the sport. Do you uh, do that at all of the distances and all the different terrains? Do you, do you go into it with a pretty heavy, heavy, heavy analytical approach? I do. Like, I don't think I'm the most like data heavy person. Like if you looked at my spreadsheets compared to other people, like I, I do a particular kind of analysis that I think helps me figure out like really hopefully novel things that have brought me success. I don't run the most data. I don't like analyze it more than anyone else, but I try to figure out insights and I try to like think about the things that no one's thought of before. Like the, the cool thing about ultra running is it's not like a distilled science where we know exactly the best way to do it yet. And so I like to understand it enough that I can try new things that few or no people have tried before and mm -hmm. see like if they work, see if I can discover something new. Um, so sometime around this time last year, I was out running during, you know, COVID quarantine, listening to podcasts because you're not running in your groups of friends. And I have downloaded a Radio Lab podcast and lo and behold, this guy called Nick Curry is the subject of a of a entire Radio Lab podcast? Yeah, that was a, a pretty cool experience. That was uh, so. For those not familiar, the Man Against Horse race happens in Prescott or near Prescott, Arizona, every year, and it's one of my favorite races of all time. Like maybe the because it's just got it's one of those super old school races still to this day where like you get to an aid station and there's probably a Tupperware bin that no one's open because the radio guys don't really understand, even though they volunteer every year that like they could take it out for runners. Uh, <laughs> the race itself is very novel in that it's called Man Against Horse because it's literally men running against horses. It's a 50 mile mountain course and you start on the same start line next to horses the race director, the official clock is this like hour and minute hand, like no, no second hand, even wall clock. And he looks at it and he's like, all right, get going. And that's the start. And you're like, is that go? And the horses take off in a cloud of dust and you're coughing on it for a bit. And the first 10 miles are flat. So they put a ton of time on you, but then you start getting up in the mountains and it gets rocky or it gets steep and the men are better at some things or the people uh, the horses are better at other things and you start trading back and forth with them. Uh, and then they, they, the horses have three manda mandatory vet checks because a horse could literally run itself to death. So one of the big emphasis is on the safety and the health of the horses. Uh, and so you'll often pass the horses in there and then they'll pass you back, but you're ultimately trying to race to the finish. And uh, for whatever reason, NPR Radio Lab had decided to come out to the race that year. And that happened to be a year that 
I was getting in really good shape. Um, and one of the interesting things about the race, uh, for better or worse, probably for worse for the runners is the, you're trying to beat the horses to the finish line and cross the finish line first. And there have been a couple runners who have done that in the past, uh, Paul Benet, Dennis Pulheco, or some local runners who have done it. Uh, but the horses ultimately in the final result get to subtract out the mandatory hold times, which is 75 minutes. It's an hour and 15 minutes. And no one's ever beat them like in the final results by time. And so what I was able to do is actually do that. And I was more than an hour and 15 minutes ahead of the lead horse crossing the finish line. And so I was able to win outright and NPR was there to cover the story, which was pretty cool. Pretty amazing. Um, have like, what's it like to, because we're all a bunch of nerds and we kind of get each other and we have similar brain waves. What's it like to try to tell a story like that to like a mainstream audience and journalists covering a niche sport, but for the mainstream? Yeah, it was like, it was interesting working with the like reporters because they're like NPR is awesome. I listen to a ton of their podcasts and everything else. I assume a lot of people do. Uh, and like anyone who hasn't listened to it, I'd encourage it not because of me, but because they do a great job telling the story, make it really engaging, keep it lighthearted. Um, but like, I remember being in the like studio with them, uh, after the fact, and they kind of reran, it took like over two hours. And I, you know, they probably used an hour, a minute and 30 seconds of my actual audio, I would think. Uh, but they, they kind of pulled me through the story and they'd stop me on this and they'd ask me about that. And I feel like they really did a good job teasing out kind of that relatable side of things, mm -hmm. um, both that, and then kind of the, the unique things that are in an ultra runner's head at the same time. Uh, like the thing that really stands out was uh, they were trying to get my mindset late in the race, you know, and I'm, you know, maybe 10 miles from the finish. And uh, it's a, a point where you're terrified if you're trying to beat the horses because you're ahead of them because you passed the third mandatory hold. But the last like seven miles are all fast, fast. <laughs> like once those horses hit, even like, especially the last three, uh, it's like, I can't run 20 miles per, per hour, but they can. <laughs> and so you're just trying, you're like running terrified, hoping that the horse isn't close enough to catch you, hoping that you're going to, you have a big enough lead and you can maintain it, that you're not going to get caught in the last stretch, which actually the first time I ran that race, Jamil and I were both ahead at the last like three miles to go. I got past Jamil was just barely on the horizon. I can, he was a little blip and I'm just yelling, go, go, go. And the horse is just <laughs> trashing after him. And he got caught less than a mile to the finish. Wow. And so like a, a lot of that was kind of on my mind when I was running in 2019 and as radio lab, like the it, it, interviewers walked me through it, they were pulling out all these emotions that I experienced during the race but it's like, it's something that's hard to articulate otherwise. And they were, they were doing it in this remarkable way where I could actually like express kind of those emotions that I think it's what draws a lot of us to ultras. It's something that, yeah, we don't know exactly how to describe without someone doing it. Uh, but they were able to get that out of me. So I thought that was really cool how they could facilitate that communication to any person. Yeah, it was, I mean, stories of ultra running are easy sells for me because I feel like I'm on the inside, but the radio lab episode was super compelling. Like it went by really fast. So yeah, you're a great storyteller and they're a great team of storytellers too. Um, you have had a focus sort of in and out in your long time of ultra running with 24 hour races, but it seems like there has been a little bit more focus in the last couple of years for you in 20, 24 hour running. Yep. Um, you said on social media that Whiskey Basin last weekend was a tune up uh, for a 24 hour race coming up now, I guess in just about a week and a half. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about what's about to happen? <laughs> Yeah, so the in a week and a half, it's the Alexander County 24 hour in North Carolina. And it's the last chance qualifier for the world, the US 24 hour team to compete at the world championships in Romania in October. And two years ago, uh, I guess it was 2018, I qualified for the 2019 world team as the fifth of sixth member. 
at the time that I ran Desert Solstice. And then the world championship got pushed back six months. So they pushed back the qualification period. And I got bumped at the very last second and the last day of qualifying at a race. And so I, this time in 2020, I ran Desert Solstice again. I again qualified with the fifth of six spots and said, I will be at that last chance qualifier. You know, COVID pushed it back, same exact story. And I'm like, I don't care what happens. I will be there. If I have to defend it, I will. And so I signed up for it. Uh, I'm feeling good and healthy, but it doesn't look like I'm going to have to do that kind of performance. And given how much a, a, an all out 24 hour can take, like I'm looking to kind of run it as a training run, play with some variables that I, have been a struggle for me before Worlds and try to see if I've worked out those kinks. Uh, but hopefully like not completely destroy myself in derail training. So this will be like a, a mini bump, take a little recovery and then do a final build to worlds. So the window for qualifying for the U S 24 hour team closes essentially after this race in a week and a half. Right. Correct. So the men who have the top qualifying, the six men who have the top qualifying times from within the window, go to the team and go on. You're currently carrying the fifth uh, fifth yep. top time, hundred was it 155 miles at Desert Solstice? Yep. Okay. Um, we talked before this interview started about the challenges of, yeah, practicing for 24 hour races and how you're wanting to use this as to retooling things. What are you working on? What, what are the kinds of things that you can't actually practice uh, for 24 hour racing? What do you have to like actually do in a race to do and learn? Yeah, so one of the, the specific issue that uh, kind of took me down the last two 24 hours I've run is my quads just started feeling like this deep ache and burn and thrash. Mm. Uh, it were the last worlds, I, I still went and ran as an alternate, I just couldn't score points. And it started at like three hours. <laughs> and then it just was there, but not slowing wow. me down for until like 15 or 16 hours. And then it just completely tanked me. Like I tried to keep going and I was reduced to a, a sad block. And that was that. And it desert solstice this past time, it was the exact same thing. It just started at eight hours and then took till 20. And then same thing. Like I, I literally stopped desert solstice because it felt like I'm doing permanent damage. Like I've had a long ultra running career already. Uh, and I'm very aware how quickly people burn out. And so I'm very wary to push like a hundred percent all the way through bad times very often because like that can easily shorten my career by years. And so like I had the lead by a good bit. I backed off, uh, Ryan Montgomery, who was in second, started chasing me down. Anyone that watched it, like I, it felt bad because like, this is the most anticlimactic end. And then it turned out to be like probably one of the best, uh, like engaging ends of a race. Uh, so I had to get back out there again. But like, I, I was on like so much on edge, just my quads felt so bad, so destroyed. So just like the, the muscles weren't firing at all. Mm -hmm. um, so for the first time I've come to terms with, it's time to start doing like non-running work. So, you know, some body weight exercises, some more strengthening flexibility, all that kind of thing. So I've been doing that the, basically this whole year now. So um, I'm hopeful that that was a big part of the issue. I've addressed some form issues as well. So uh, that's like, that's hard to simulate when it may not start till eight hours. It seems super dependent on like the relentlessness of a 24 hour. Like mm -hmm. those things don't pop up. If you get change of terrain, if you get, you know, trails and mountains, it's like just the same repetitiveness that like, you don't like, it's hard to train that long to find out if that's there. Uh, it's just mind numbing to do it on a normal day. Uh, so that's one of the big issues. I think um, what you kind of described is a process that a lot of ultra runners experience that they realize that there's like some sort of physical limitation that maybe you do have to do strength work and mobility work to try to, yeah, lengthen your career, or create more durability. Can you just talk a little bit about the specific exercises you're, you're trying? Yeah. So like, I, I do just, uh, like I have a coach James Benet right now and he's with McMillan, uh, their ultra running coaching. And so they have some programs that he's having me do. And it's just 
it's like twice a week, maybe 15 to 20 minutes. And, you know, it's, it's just a, a varying rotation of basic body weight stuff, or a few of them use some dumbbells. So everything from push-ups to like stuff with exercise balls, um, just very light because when you're coming from zero, like that makes a huge difference already. Um, and then the other one, because I've had perpetual issues with like planter and tight calves mm -hmm. and it, it's funny cause I've had this for more than a decade and I finally came to terms with, or finally like, diagnosed and realized my hamstrings are super tight, which uh. it's one of those, it seems obvious in hindsight, like I've been hammering on my calves because they're always tight, but they're connected to hamstrings. So as much as I got the calves loose, I wasn't working the whole chain. And so like, I've been doing just even just air squats. I do them once or twice a day, just kind of, you know, when I'm getting up in the morning before a run, or if I'm unwinding at night and really pay attention to the form, pay attention to stretching through them. It gets a little strength on top of it. Once in a while, I'll throw a kettlebell just to kind of mix up how it's stressing it. Uh, and I think it's made a huge difference. Uh, we'll find out. Yeah. Well, you'll um, have to, yeah, either make a comment to this interview or post on social media. Yeah, if it works out because we're all, yeah, we're all sort of going through that process and trying to figure out how to be more durable while touring this, right? Yep. Well, super interesting to talk to you. I can't believe this is the first time I run far has interviewed you, but congratulations on your uh, win at Whiskey Basin. Good luck at Alexander. County. County, yep. thank you. <laughs> in two weekends. All right. Yeah. Thanks so much, Nick. Thanks, Megan.